to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Do you know what the very last word in the Bible is? It's the word, Amen. What do you really know about that unique word? We all are very familiar with it in the sense that we use it regularly. We say it daily when we pray. We hear about it a lot. But what does the word, Amen, actually mean? And how is that word used in Scripture, and how should it be used in my life? We welcome you today to our study of this subject in our special study series. As always, we encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where you can find a host of Bible study material. We have lessons online in video and audio transcripts, as well as study questions. You can access all that material free of charge, or if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons in DVD or CD form, you can contact us either through email or through our website, and we'd make that available to you free of charge as well. Friend, we hope that you will also visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people there who love the Word of God and have a sincere love for souls. If you've got a Bible question, they'd love to sit down and study the Scripture with you as we would as well. And so any way that we can help you in your study of God's Word, please don't hesitate to contact us. For our subject at hand, such a unique and unusual word, the word Amen. It's been said that there are four universal words that are known in any language across the world. Those four words are okay, hallelujah, amen, and coke. Of those words, we think about the word amen today. Amen has been called the best, uh, regardless of language, been called the best known word in human speech. It's the, actually the last word in the Bible, as we mentioned, Revelation 22, 21, when God closes out his final revelation, he places his own amen upon those words. Did you know that most books of the New Testament actually end with the word amen? Here's a little more information about it. Concerning this word amen, it's used in the Greek New Testament 129 times. It occurs some 77 times in the English Bible. And so it's one of those words that we hear over and over again, that we say a lot, that we even hear others say. But today we want to think about what does this word really mean? How did God use it? And how does God expect me to use this word? Here are a couple of interesting facts about the idea of amen. Did you know that the word amen is actually a quality used as a quality characteristic of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And so when we think about this word amen, we're talking about that which is true and faithful, Jesus being the epitome of that. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. First Timothy said, of Jesus it is said that He cannot lie. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse number 8. This word, which is also used in the Old Testament in a form, is also related to God. God is called the Amen. For example, Isaiah 65, verse number 16, So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the, and the English Bible records, in the God of truth, but it's actually the Hebrew word, Amen. And he who swears in the earth 
shall swear by the God of truth. And so God is called the God of truth, which that word is the equivalent of our word, amen. And so we're talking about true. God, He cannot change. Malachi 3 verse 6. He cannot lie. Hebrews 6 verse 18. His character is sure and solid and He's faithful in all things. That's the very nature of the God whom we serve. You know, as we think about the subject of amen, we might ask ourselves, why do we really need to study such a lesson as this? Well, as we've already seen, this is a very familiar word and I want to be familiar with it and know how to use it correctly, but here are some other reasons. I want to study the word amen because it is a word that I use every day when I pray. At the close of every prayer, I say amen. Why do I say that? What does that mean? Why do we do that? What's the import and the importance of such a statement? Now you can be sure, studying such a subject, it's not to elicit anybody to say amen in Bible class or a sermon, although there'd be nothing wrong with that. It ought to come from the heart. We study this subject because this is a word that occurs so much in Scripture, 130 times nearly in the Bible. It's a very frequent word, and we want to study this subject because it has a, a very rich and encouraging background for the child of God. When this word is used, God is placing a, a, a solid surety, a, a faithfulness, and a truth on something that we absolutely are encouraged about. And so this word, amen, it's not really an English word. It is a transliteration of the Greek word, amen. What we simply did is because we didn't really have a word for that, we took the Greek letters in the word amen and we came up with a new word, amen, like baptism. We didn't really have a word, we didn't select the correct word, should have been immersion, but baptism in the Greek Testament is baptizo, and so we just transliterated the idea of baptism, much along the same lines with the word amen in the Bible. Well, what does this word mean? It originates from a Hebrew word meaning to build up or support. It carries the idea in Hebrew of something with a solid foundation, a bedrock foundation, uh, some kind of pillar, some kind of post that cannot be moved. Some great lasting support is the idea in the Hebrew. Defined by Greek les lexicons, it simply means firm or truly. It means something that is certain. It carries the connotation of, of absolutely or often. When we say it in prayer or when we hear people say it after something God says, it's like it's the idea of may it be so or let that come to pass. Absolutely, that's what we want is the idea in Scripture. It's used very uniquely in the Gospel of John and it helps us maybe to understand it a little. In the Gospel of John it is translated as verily, verily in the King James or truly, truly. For example, John 3 verses 3 through 5. Jesus is discussing the subject of getting into the kingdom and the new birth with Nicodemus and he says unto Nicodemus, Verily, verily, amen, amen, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus saying? This is a fact. Take it to the bank. Certainly, you cannot get into the kingdom without being born of water and the Spirit. And so it carries a, a beautiful, solid idea that we find is very rich in the New Testament and in the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's what we find interesting about the word Amen. The Holy Spirit actually helps us in defining this word in a couple of very unique passages, parallel passages that we find in our Bible. For example, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus said unto them, the Greek word is Amen, New King James, King James, Verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, there be some of them that stand here which shall not, shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. And so as we think about this idea, we also learn from Luke 9, 27, parallel passage, Jesus said, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here 
who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now, Mark uses the word, Greek word, which we know is the word amen or amen, but Luke in that parallel passage uses a different word, aletheos, which is the word for truth. And so parallel passages help us to understand a little for that word amen is supplied and supplemented by the word truth. And so when we talk about amen, we're talking about something that's true something that is sure, something that is solid and absolute in every way. And what a wonderful idea that applies to God's children. You know, we often think of the word amen, and it kind of represents and is synonymous with our word yes. And it's used that way in the Bible. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 20. For all the promises of God in Him, in Jesus, now notice this, are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Notice how those two ideas are synonymous. Yes, surely, and amen. Those go hand in hand. And so when we say amen, we're saying surely, we're saying yes, we're saying absolutely. That's something that's true and solid from Almighty God to His Christians or to His children. Now, here's an interesting idea that I want you to think about for just a moment. What is the first usage of the word Amen in Scripture? It's a very interesting context in Numbers chapter 5. I want you to take your Bible and notice in Numbers chapter 5 with me how this is used in context and what a wonderful idea this applies to the children of God. Now, the context is a scene that is very interesting about adultery and immorality and the things that were going on in that context and how, how a husband and a wife can actually know if fornication or adultery had been committed one by the other. Numbers 5.19 says, And the priest shall put her under oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray to uncleanness while under your husband's authority, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled your husband and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse. He shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. When the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell, and may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach, make your belly swell and your thigh rot, and here it is, and the woman shall say, Amen, so be it. First usage in the Bible. What a, a, an interesting context. You've got someone who's been accused of adultery. You've got a test that God sends the priest upon the woman to prove. She drinks this water. Part of her part in the test is she's got to agree to it. And in agreeing, she's saying, If I've committed adultery, let this water cause these things to me. If not, let it prove it as well. And to confirm this oath, which in itself is a fearful oath, the woman says, Amen. What's she agreeing to? She's agreeing. When this woman says, Amen, she is agreeing to God's law and she's giving to consent to the punishment if she's lied. Amen was used as an oath here of truthfulness and surety with a sense of gravity and awe and respect for the Almighty indeed being used in this context. Now, what about Christians today? When we say amen, what exactly are we saying? Friend, it's a very serious thing to say amen, and here's what we're saying. We're saying, yes, before God, I agree with that, I believe that to be true, I want that to be so in my life. When I say amen, not only am I saying, that's right and I agree with it, I am consenting to that teaching, I'm confirming my faith in Scripture, and I'm requesting or asking for something to be true or happen in my life. When someone preaches the Word and we say amen, not only are we saying, preacher, that's right, we're also saying, I agree with that. I'm ready to make my life in line with that teaching regardless of the consequences. When we say amen after prayer, we're confirming our faith in, in God who's promised 
that these things will be true. We're requesting that something happen or be true in our life. And so there's a, a sense of seriousness when we say that. It's not just saying yes. There's a whole lot more to it than that. And it carries a, a beautiful connotation of our trust in God and our willingness to uh, agree to His will and put that to use in our lives from day to day. Now, how should we use? You know, sometimes I believe the word, if we're not careful, can be used flippantly. Someone may say amen, and we may hear that often and regular, and even, it may become even habitual. How should the word amen be used by a child of God? First, it needs to be used intelligibly, with understanding, and with the mind engaged in what we're saying. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 15 and 16 says, I will sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. I'll pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding. When I sing and when I pray, I need to understand what I'm singing and praying. Friend, as we close prayer with amen, we also need to think about what it is we're saying. And here's what we mean by that. We need to think about what am I really asking God for? I need to think about the promises of God and how I can always trust Him and the surety of those promises. And I need to think about what it is I'm actually agreeing to. For example, sometimes when the gospel is preached and we maybe talk about sin or we talk about evangelism or we talk about Bible study, somebody may chime in and say amen. Is that person really saying amen because... He wants to consent to that. His life is ready to change. He wants to go out and get to work doing those things. Are we really not only just saying yes, but agreeing to that in our life by the actions that we show? Secondly, amen should always come from the heart. John 4 verse 24, the Bible says, God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. What we mean by this is simply, you can't force that to happen. It's not something you can say, okay, when I go to services today, I'm going to say amen. No, it doesn't work that way. It's got to come from the heart. It must be something that is from the emotion, the seed of understanding combined with that. John 4 verse 24, and out of a heartfelt desire to worship God, to honor Him, to change our lives and be in line with His teaching and with His way of life. Here's what's so amazing in the Bible. When we see the word Amen, it's after something amazing usually happens, like in the book of Revelation. It's after some great truth that we really want in our life, that we want to change to, that we want to glorify God with. And so it's got to be heartfelt. It can't be forced. It can't be something that, you know, that's just what we're supposed to do. It's got to come from the heart from a child of God. It must be said in faith. I can't say amen if I really don't do it in faith based on the Word of God. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrew, seek him Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. And so when we say amen, it needs to be based on faith, meaning based on the Word of God, based on our understanding of that Word, and based on our willingness to live that by faith in our lives as a child of God. But you know, as we think about uttering the word amen, it also should be uttered in hope of the promises of God. Listen to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 18. The scripture records Jesus saying, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. I, I was alive, I was, I'm, I was dead, now I'm alive forevermore. And then you hear that word, Amen. It's based on the hope of the resurrection, based on the future life of Christ, and all the promises and blessings that go along with that. And so hope ought to be a part of our utterance of this word. Now friend, we want to mention this as well. And we've hit on this a little bit, but it's so important as we think about this idea. Don't say amen unless you plan on doing something after you say that. 
I want you to notice Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse number 26. The Bible records, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law, and all people shall say, Amen. Friend, it's a very serious thing to say, Amen. God says, Cursed are you if you don't perform all the things written in this law. And God said, I want you to agree to it by saying amen. When someone says amen, you've got to plan on doing something with that truth you're confirming. For example, it might be a, a, a great lesson or someone might read the Bible or hear God's Word spoken about, say for example, the subject of giving, that God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 and 7, that Christians ought to give as they've purposed on their heart on the first day of the week and that we ought to give just like that widow who gave those two mites and somebody might chime in with an amen and then when the collection plate comes around, they're too stingy to put anything in. Wait a minute now. If I'm going to say amen, I better back it up by actually doing something with that truth that I've placed my confirmation on. Someone talks about maybe preaching the Word of God and we want to preach truth. We want to preach it in season. We want God's truth to come forth. And when it hits a hard subject in which we're encouraged to change our life, we've said amen to it. But then sometimes... We go home and not really make the changes that we ought to make. Amen means I'm going to do something. I'm going to change something. I'm going to believe something. I'm going to put some kind of action to work in my life based on this confirmation I've given to God's truth. Now, let's follow it up by maybe mentioning three or four things in Scripture that Christians surely ought to place their amen toward. First, as God's children, we ought to have the attitude of amen toward God's law in our lives. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 27? God gave all those cursings and blessings. And in verse 26, God said, I want you to place your oath on my law by saying amen. Friend, that attitude ought to be ours. When it comes to God's law, we ought to have an attitude of amen. That is, I want to know the law. Study to show yourself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, not only do I want to know it, I want to live it in my life. I want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2 21, I want to let others know about that law and I want to live in hope of what that law promises, eternal life. 1 John 2 verse number 25. A second thing of which the scripture affirms we ought to have an attitude of amen about is worship and praise toward God. Notice 1 Chronicles 16 Verse number 36, the scripture says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people shall say, and all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. In this wonderful setting of worship and praise to God, people place their amen on worship of God. Friend, when we praise God, when we worship Him, not just our words, but our heart, our mindset, and our attitude always ought to be truly, faithfully, in hope, in love. We're worshiping and giving our heart, not just our heart, but our lives and our attitude to the Almighty God. Thirdly, as we think about the word Amen, when God's Word is read and preached, there ought to be from every child of God the attitude and the mindset of Amen. Notice Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want you to notice what happens in this amazing context. Notice verses 5 and 6. The scripture says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is such an interesting scene. The Word of God had not been given its prime place of importance as it should have for a long time. They're now gathered back in the restoration era after captivity, and what a heartfelt scene. They stand up, the Word of God is open and read, and the people cry out, Amen, Amen. How good it must have been to hear the God, Word of God in that scene. And friend, 
how good it is that we live in a land, that we have the Word of God, we live in a land where we can hear it, and how we ought to place our confirmation upon the reading and preaching of God's Holy Word. And then, a fourth thing that we ought to place amen upon is our attitude of confirmation and trust in God in prayer. Matthew 6, verse 13, Jesus ended His prayer teaching the disciples how to pray with thy kingdom done, thy, will be, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then at the end of that he said, Amen. Friend, when we pray, we ought to have the attitude of Amen. We ought to have the attitude of knowing God's the one who we can trust with these promises and blessings and desires. God is the one who is able to accomplish these things and not men. And so as our attitude and as our heart is, so goes our life in so many things and in so many areas today. Now, we want to mention one last thing, of which every Christian surely ought to place a hope-felt confirmation upon, and that is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Listen to it again. Revelation 1 Verse 18, the Scripture says, Jesus speaking, I am He who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Where is the rock-solid foundation of our hope in this amen? Based upon the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I am He who was alive, there's His life, was dead, His burial and death, and I am He who is alive forevermore. Friend, where's my hope and where's your hope? It's in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel. And so we ask you today, are you a Christian? Have you heard the Word of God? Do you believe in Jesus, John 8, 24? Would you repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3, confessing His name before men? And would you be immersed in water, placing your confirmation on God's truth as is taught in Mark 16, 16? May we not just say amen. May we live that attitude throughout our lives, bringing honor and glory to the Father. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallets. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. And to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, this is the Gospel of Christ.